Attention all you rule breakers, you misfits and troublemakers, all you free spirits and pioneers, all you visionaries and nonconformists. Everything the establishment has told you is wrong with you is actually what's right with you. You see things others don't. You are hardwired to change the world. Unlike nine out of ten people, your mind is irrepressible, and this threatens authority. You were born to be a revolutionary. And it wants them eliminated. So your whole life you've been told your strengths were weaknesses. Now I'm telling you otherwise. Your impulsivity is a gift. Impulses are your key to the miraculous. Your distractibility is an artifact of your inspired creativity. Your mood swings reflect the natural pulse of life. They give you unstoppable energy when you're high, deep soulful insight when you're low. Diagnosed with a disorder, that society's latest way to deny its own illness by pointing the finger at you. Your addictive personality is just a symptom of your vast, underused capacity for heroic creative expression and spiritual connection. Your utter lack of repression, your wide-eyed idealism, your unmitigated open mind. Didn't anyone ever tell you, these are the traits shared by the great Some miraculous genetic- 
penetrate some psychotropic chemical, or maybe even by the will of your own soul, your brain's reward pathways have been hijacked. Dopamine employed to overthrow the fascist dictatorship of your prefrontal cortex. Now your brain is free of repression. Your mind free of censorship. Your awareness exposed to the turbulent seas of the unconscious. Through this open doorway, divine light shines into your consciousness, showing you the way. This is what makes you a way seer. Ninety percent of human civilization is populated with those whose brains are blocked to the way. Their brains are hardwired to enforce the social programming indoctrinated since birth. Unlike you, they cannot break out of this programming because they have not yet experienced the necessary revolution of mind. These program people take social institutions and rules very seriously. Society is full of games programmed to keep people's minds occupied so they will not revolt. These games often cause sick fixations on peculiar protocols, power structures, taboos, and domination, all subtle forms of human bondage. This distinct form of madness is not only tolerated by the masses, but insisted upon. The program ones believe in rules so forcefully, they become willing to destroy anyone who violates them. Wayseers are the ones who call their bluff. Since wayseer minds are free to reject social programming, wayseers readily see these social institutions for what they are, imaginary games. Wayseers comfort the disturbed, the comfortable. Helping those who are lost in these games and refuse to help themselves is the calling of many wayseers. Since wayseers are the ones who keep contact with the original source of reality, they are able to disrupt societal conventions and even governments to realign humanity with the way. The wayseers are an ancient lineage, a kind of priesthood, carriers of the flame, ones in the know. There must always be wayseers to reform the show and after that absolutely fantastic song where do you actually start without feeling totally totally inspired tonight i can honestly tell you this is going to be one of the best shows we will have done that is no disrespect to anybody else we've had on the show but i can tell you now it is going to be fantastic and of course firstly we have got Max and Bill and I who are going to be sharing the link, so thank you to both of them. But also, there's only one sister I could have on a show like this to literally make it blow your mind. It's got to be Kathy. Hi, Kathy. How are you doing? Hi, Sue. Hi, everyone in the chat room and all the people listening. I am so excited. 
I mean, I have goosebumps, chill bumps. I'm, I'm quivering. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm in awe of this man. I'm so excited. This is, this is just. It's been a dream to meet someone like him. I mean, you know, his whole, his whole uh, platform really is don't be one of the nine out of ten people. Be the one out of the ten people. You know, stand up. And I'm just, I put the link to the Wayseers Manifesto video, and it will give you chill bumps to watch it and listen to it. He's a powerful, powerful soul, powerful man. It's going to be a great show, honestly, a terrific show. And I just wanted to say to everybody, just in case you don't know who this guy is, but I'm just firstly going to say this, Kathy, when you've heard that song a few times, it gets to the stage, you listen to it, and it, it, I can't explain. It, like, inspires you, gives you goosebumps and everything every time you hear it. It's one of those songs after that you're actually singing in your mind. And it's and he's just done it amazingly. It's just it's everything all of us have been speaking about for weeks and weeks and weeks. Do you know what I mean? And he puts that together and just makes it, oh, what can I say? Let, let's stop talking. Let me just say to everybody, it, the guy that we're going to be calling in a minute is one of the best, one of the, oh, just an amazing speaker, one who's actually getting out there. And the Ask Sue Show, Kathy, Max, Bill, myself and everybody, is going to be joining forces with Garrett John, the voice behind the Way Seer Manifesto. That is the founder of the Way Seers Movement, and it's facebook.com forward slash Way Seers. Now, I am just very privileged to say I am just about to give a call. So let's um, go and see if he's awake. <laughs> it's just a fun to say that, doesn't it? I think we all need to cheer for his answers. <laughs> Hello. Hello, is that Garrett? You are live on air on the Ask Sue show. And that was my youngest. Oh my gosh. Giving you a round of applause. <laughs> God. How are you doing, Garrett? All right. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, well, I've got Kathy, who's the co host with me. Hi, Garrett. I am absolutely in awe of you, and I. This is, and I'm honored to be in your presence today, and my heart and my ears are open, and we are just, thank you for coming. Thank you for taking time for us and your schedule. Well, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> well, we've, we've just been playing your song, and we were just saying what an inspiration it is to us, and uh, you know how we're getting goosebumps off it, and how you literally put in a song what we've been ranting about for weeks. <laughs> That, oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to soul. be of service. <laughs> yeah, that song is in my soul. It's in the very core of me. I cannot shake that song. I don't want to. Oh, it's good. in me. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> Keep it there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who I am. Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. So, so can you tell people about yourself. You know, how did it all start? What are you all about? What are you wanting? <laughs> well, I uh, I was born to a uh, virgin, and uh, then three uh, wise men came and bore gifts to me at, in the stable I was born in. Um, and then I had an epiphany and enlightenment, and um, and I started healing people spontaneously. I'm joking, of course. <laughs> say I was thinking oh my god I've rung the wrong number <laughs> <laughs> I love a man with a sense of humor okay oh god. <laughs> after today it could possibly happen <laughs> that's the first I, you know we asked the show it's an hour she was here <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, we Garrett, we are kind of a, a no filter show. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sorry, that's just I, I get some speaking for myself here. So later on, after you've spoken for a while, I'm sure I'll come out with some questions that are really uh, from my heart and very, uh, very profound information that I can learn from you. Is how I can say it, I suppose. So uh, please mm -hmm. continue. Please, please continue. <laughs> okay. So what would you like me to talk about now? Carry on. 
Well, yeah, go on, carry on. What what were you about? Well, you know, tell people that have not heard your songs, if that's the first time they've heard it, tell people what you're all about or what you're wanting to achieve. Yeah, all right. I well, question. I am. I have uh, one question. I am. Okay, let's go. What's what, the question? What, what? Okay. What was the one thing that inspired this movement in your heart that led to all this? Love, <clears throat> love, and and the creative process that lies dormant in so many wayseers, and that mm-hmm. causes all sorts of afflictions. You see. Mm-hmm. If you watch the video, you see there's a section of wayseers behaving badly, and that's when I'm singing about sex addicts and derelicts and drama queens. Mm -hmm. And this is the other edge of the double-edged sword when a truly creative and neurologically open human being isn't expressing their gifts of creativity, then often those gifts turn in on themselves and turn into all sorts of afflictions. And those afflictions, I think, are the thing that is holding our planet back from the prosperity we could be experiencing if all of the creative ones, all of the wayseers, could just turn on, tune in, come together, and make beautiful things happen. Thank you. Wonderful answer. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just really wanted to know what 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 really began your movement, or what was it that inspired you? And you answered you answered perfectly. And I am taking notes, by the way, so thank you. Okay. Yes, please please take notes. <laughs> there will be a quiz at the end. No problem. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, and the, the competition prize will be to join um, the Wayseers uh, profiles on Facebook. Um, and the, obviously, the first person who wins it will obviously be able to join, but also everybody else needs to join as well if you want to awaken. So, um, now, how many people do you think are actually following now, Gareth? Have we got any ideas of what numbers you've actually pulled together so far? Well, the video has had almost 7 million views worldwide. So that's one number for you, 7 million. Uh, Now, to put that in perspective, I believe there are about 700 million people who would fit the profile of Wayseer. So we've only reached about 1%. Exactly, exactly. The thing is, Oh, how can I, I, I must admit, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. It's like there's so much I want to ask you, and it's like, where do we start? Because with the Ask Sue show, I've been doing the rant, Kathy's been doing the rant, Max in the chat room, he just absolutely idolizes you. And he woke me up, let's just say, and said, right, you need to get in, listen, you need to listen, watch the Lumati, you need to look at all these different pages that are opening, you need to realize that the world is waking up, that 12, 12, 12 days, then he put me in touch with you, and so I mm-hmm. owe it to Max, actually, who's in the chat room, who honestly, absolutely, I like you. And also, I've heard on the grapevine that you're wanting a few more people to join forces to be your speakers as well. Well, we're we're launching a new initiative called Upriser, which is not just for a few more people, and they're not. It's not intended for people to follow me. It's intended for people to lead. Uh, we need leaders to come join Upriser. It's upriser.com. And this is the place where wayseers can start showing the way and dialoguing with one another to discover higher and higher refinements of what the way is calling us to do. Okay. Well, you've just um, been able to get on board three people, myself, Kathy, and Max. All right. I know without a shadow Excellent. of a doubt. And you've just gained right. a show every single Saturday. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I really appreciate that. We could use all the help we can get. And I just want to make it clear that we're not, you know, I'm not looking for followers. I'm looking for leaders. I'm looking for people who already know in their heart uh, the, the what needs to be done because we don't need another guru out there telling people how to, do their stuff. What we need is to awaken 
each of us to our own wisdom and start leading. And that's why we're working on this Upriser project so that everyone can dialogue with one another. It's totally horizontal, totally flat, no hierarchy. And through that, we can co-create the world we all want to experience tomorrow. Oh, Ali, you, you is all I can say to that. What, why has it so, Garrett, why do you think that it's only took till 2012 for the world to wake up? Why has it took so long for us all to start take, you know, to be able to wake up to these things? And, you know, what's the sudden change in it? I mean, I'm very spiritual and Max will have his thoughts as well on, on why it took till now. But what do you personally think? Why has it took till now? I think we needed to experience collectively what has gotten us to this point there is a certain establishment in the physical world that was required the uh, industrial revolution had its needs and those are sort of command and control hierarchical needs that's the only way you can really run a military industrial complex is is the with the hierarchy and the command and control and that was like a plague on our planet so now with the information age where we're all being interconnected, finally this, we have this communication ability. That's allowing us to drop all the nonsense. Yeah. See, the Before that, you, we couldn't communicate. When we couldn't communicate, it was so much easier. I mean, for one thing, uh, people who had a real spiritual disposition or people who had a real light about them or those uh, rare geniuses – had no way of finding others like them in the world. They were isolated. Yeah. And so they kept to themselves, and it kept, it kept a lid on all of that stuff. But now with the Internet, we can connect with each other. And when we can connect with each other, we recognize we have all these common gifts. And with that, we get the courage to start expressing those gifts more powerfully. Garrett, I have a question. Uh, there are so many people out there, and let me say again, you know, I'm, I've always been the one out of ten. I've been a little revolutionary, a little renegade, and quite often the nine out of ten look at us like we're crazy. But now mm -hmm. with the age, as you say, we are able to reach these people. What do you think mm -hmm. is the one most important message that we can start with to glean their attention? Because I try to wake them up. You mean the and nine out of ten? Yeah. The nine out of ten. The nine out of ten. Let me put it to you this way: um, to judge the nine out of ten is just as wrong as oh, when the nine that. out of ten judge us, right? So we're not wrong. judging. Exactly. Either way is the right way. The nine out of ten are neurologically. Um, closed. And what that means is they're much more stable than way seers are. They're much more timely. They're much better at um, internalizing the programming that a society and culture has to offer. So that means that they can run the programs really well. And that's really important for the stability of a society. Now, mm -hmm. way seers have this other thing going on in their brains, which overrides the censoring agents of the prefrontal cortex. That means they're neurologically open. That means beautiful new ideas can come to them and they can receive those consciously. Those ideas would ordinarily be censored by the prefrontal cortex because they are outside of the programming. And the prefrontal cortex is designed to enforce the programming, the rules of the programming. So anything that's outside of the box, outside of the programming, gets censored by the prefrontal cortex usually, and when the uh, way seer brain, which is uh, used the, the reward pathways to override the censoring agent of the prefrontal cortex, that means the prefrontal cortex can be used for um, visionary talents, for imagining new things, imagining new ways of doing things. It's the mind's eye, and it becomes more of a portal for brilliant uh, strokes of genius, for divine inspiration, for all of those beautiful impulses that are beyond the conscious mind's ability to come up with on its own or control. And so with that, wayseers have the uh, wonderful, unique 
opportunity to bring forth those ideas into our world, to bring forth great works of art and to bring forth great new inventions and to bring forth, bring forth great uh, social change that, is re- that we're ready for as a people. Uh, and often, you know, historically, those people who tried to bring forth those things, when the rest of the world, the other 9 out of 10, weren't ready for it, the 9 out of 10 are designed to resist change. That's because they're keeping the program stable. So when these new ideas come in, that could destabilize the programming, that could destabilize the society. And so they're, they're doing their job saying, we're not going to budge. So what it requires is a bunch of wayseers to come together to establish that new way of doing things, to show that it's a stable, trustworthy uh, innovation or progress. And when that happens, that's when the stabilizers, if you will, will say, okay, this is legitimate. This is something we can adopt. So 30 years ago, Apple was a harebrained idea, you know, Apple computer. Uh, Steve Jobs was a wild man, you know, full of nonsense. But nowadays, everyone sort of honors Apple as a, the biggest company in the world and a mainstay of the technological platform we all share. So stabilizers are using Apple products just as much as anyone else. But if you went back 30 years ago, it would only be the most cutting-edge wasteers that would even consider using a computer like the ones that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were tooling around with. Good answer. Wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still making notes here, folks, okay? I'm writing. <laughs> it will be a quiz. I, I don't want Quinn to interrupt you, Kathy. You're doing well. Carry on. <laughs> um, I did visit your Upriser site, and there's a wonderful book there. Can you tell the people a little bit about that book? Oh, the the Wayseers book. The Upriser book, that's not even uh, close to out yet. Uh, but the Wayseers book is available to people who make a contribution to the Wayseers movement and help us get the message out more. Mm-hmm. That book is an owner's manual for your Wayseers mind. So one of the common misunderstandings of the Wayseers book is we talk about the way in the Wayseer Manifesto, and the way is understood to be the truth, you know, that um, that transcendent truth that we all have access to. And people balk at the idea of a book that says the Wayseers on it. They say, well, what are you going to tell them, you know, if I know the way, why do I need a book? The book is not there to tell you the way. The book is simply there to tell you how your particular neurology works as a wayseer, how your temperament works as a wayseer, so that you can become a clearer channel of the way, so that you can become more clearly receptive of the the higher good that the way represents, the ultimate truth um, that you have access to, that divine inspiration and genius, it, the book is designed to help you open to that more and also to help you be aware of and manage the other side of not having uh, the other side of being irrepressible or having no neurological repression, which is that you are very susceptible to all kinds of impulses, and some of those impulses are very destructive. So this the Wayseers book takes you through the journey of how to uh, discern between your impulses towards a greater truth, your miraculous impulses, your impulses of creativity and genius, and how to guard and protect yourself from impulses that can lead you to all sorts of afflictions and addictions, you know, overeating, um, you know, compulsive gambling, you name it, there is an impulse that can drag you through the gutter uh, if you're not cultivating your consciousness as a wayseer. One thing I liked on the um, Wayseer Manifesto page, there was a quiz, Are You a Wayseer? And um, <laughs> I have to tell you, I got 100 on that. <laughs> ah, good for you. I did, I did, let me tell you, I did the happy dance when I got that. I'm like, I oh, no way. I was so excited, and I'm, I'm very excited about the whole movement, the, the book, all that you have to offer, your wisdom, 
um, learning from you and having you share so that we can be better people and that we can make a difference. So once again, you know, thank you for all that you're doing here, and I encourage everyone in the chat room, and I believe me, we all need to spread the word about this site because, you know, some of us know that this is what we're meant to be and others may have an inkling or whatever, but just go check out the site, you know, do your homework, and I think you'll be maybe surprised at what you learn about yourself, and uh, we can all be a better person. But uh, when you go to the site, take the quiz and 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 just see what your answer is. Lots mm -hmm. of good things on yeah. the page. Right. You'll notice if you high, score high on this quiz, you probably also scored low on your uh, homework in, in school. Uh, you know, probably were a bit of a space cadet or a troublemaker or a... Uh, you know, we're diagnosed with ADD or ADHD or who knows what other um, label they might have given you in school because that quiz also shows that you're very open and untamable in a certain way. And academia, especially uh, grade school, is designed to uh, shape the will of the 9 out of 10. And literally, uh, according to the doctrine of the original design of our U.S. school systems, and I think these systems were also adopted in, in the U.K., to break the will of that one out of ten who were considered to have very strong creative wills. That's very really interesting. Mm, seriously. Yeah. Very. Now, and, and, and that was designed at the beginning of the Industrial Age when they recognized we need compliant workers to do as they're told, not ask questions, and follow the rules. So if they they wanted a school system that would basically indoctrinate the, popu the, the, the populace to be great factory workers, be great bureaucrats, to fit into this hierarchical machine that the industrial age was becoming. And so the designers of our industrial school systems recognized that the one group of people that you really couldn't shape, you really couldn't indoctrinate them because the programming just wouldn't stick, were these highly willful, highly creative individuals that amounted to about one out of ten of the population. And so their solution to that was to set an example of them, to break their wills, to basically destroy them through the school system so that they wouldn't be a threat to the establishment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely. People. So that's, you know, that's what we're on the heels of. Yes. yes. And nowadays, instead of calling them troublemakers, which they did for the first hundred years, uh, they have the, the grace to call them, uh, well, they have ADHD. They have a disorder. Uh, they have, um, you know, Asperger's or they have uh, uh, dys dyslexia or dysgraphia. And so they give these medical diagnoses as opposed to the uh, character um, evaluation of saying they're, they're a troublemaker or they're no good or they're um, uh, addled, which is what uh, Thomas Edison's teacher said about him, that he's unteachable, that he's addled. And, uh, and nowadays they say, no, you've got a disorder, you, you poor thing. Let's put you on Ritalin because Ritalin will shut down your brain and 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 make you into a, a normal type. It will reinforce uh, the censoring agent of your prefrontal cortex, so you're no longer distracted by your creative inspiration. That's great. You know, that makes so much sense because when I was at school, I was brilliant in the classroom, but as soon as you got into the exams and you were all sat in rows and you've got like the A's were at the front and Z's were at the back, and I was like in the in, near the front at at D, and as soon as it got to the exams, I was absolutely rubbish. But the thing mm -hmm. was, you're absolutely right. I was bullied at school. I literally, um, away from everybody else, I didn't make friends easy, do you know what I mean? And, it, and you're right, I, I was the one that, and, and this is the funny part, you know, if, if you're caring, if you don't listen to, you don't actually go with everything that you're told. Um, I mean, I'm into spiritualism, which, place it, a lot of people don't understand all of that, but... That is about spreading mm -hmm. love and laughter and light and everything. Well, of course they're going to dampen that. They've even set up a law for spiritualist um, churches and mediums and all that. 
So we've got to say that our religion, and I don't class as religion, I just see it as part of my life, I don't see it as a religion, they actually have said, the law has said to us that we've got to say that this is for entertainment purposes only. Excuse me? Mm. Did they actually make the mm-hmm. vicars go and stand in front of their churches and say, sorry, this is for entertainment purposes only? Huh. I actually kind of like that. We could run with that. Oh, I, I we could would run, run with, with that. I don't do running <laughs> very often, but I run with that. Well, there is a lot. You of know, I, 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 I found that you know the thing about the th- the problem with uh, religion and with atheism is that they take it far too seriously. They're missing the point that mo- most yeah. spirituality is much more about the metaphor, and that's an ineffable quality that is that spirituality is pointing towards it's it's like you know we're pointing towards the moon that's that that old buddha saying pointing towards the moon but it's not the finger that is supposed to be the focus it's what the finger is pointing to which is the moon which is unreachable which is like the metaphor which is that ineffable quality so often i will say you know when people start taking me too seriously and what i'm saying too seriously i say well i am an entertainer don't take me too seriously because then you're taking literally something that's supposed to be uh more like a dance more like a play more like a uh a spontaneous melody that just rings in our hearts and so you know i understand that it feels like they're putting you down by saying uh it's uh, it's just entertainment, which is what they're trying to do, because that makes it non-threatening to the society. But at the same time, it's liberating, because that gives us the permission to say everything we really want to say and not be burned at the stake. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, don't you find that there's loads of different things? It's not just spiritualism. There's loads of um, little bits. Do you know what I mean? There's loads of pieces that... Mm-hmm. Are, all over society that, you know, we actually miss. It's not until we actually wake up and start thinking, hold on a minute, yeah, what about that? Because uh, I want to just ask you, what are your thoughts on the Illuminati and to do with the government and all that? Because I, I must admit, I've been awoken by Max, who's in the chat room, um, and he's shown me these things that, you know, different things that these governments are doing and whatever. Now, I'll be honest, six months ago, I would have said to you, what a load of rubbish, and, you know, Oh no, that that can't be possible, and I don't believe that. That's something right. But when I started to watch these videos and actually started to take notes, then I was thinking, actually, that does actually make sense. Mm. You know I mean, if if right. Trump just literally says to you, um, the government is um, corrupt or it's whatever, or if I, if you said something um, to me, you know, just as Joe blogs, I wouldn't listen to it. I would think, oh no, that can't be quite right. But then I think to myself now, hold on a minute, I need to just listen. Even if I don't take it all in, at least just listen. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. And, and yes, I know what you that. mean. I, I keep saying to people, you know, people have got to understand, Joe Vlogs has been asleep quite a while, and they aren't going to just wake up literally by our one sentence or our one song or whatever, and it's just trying to change people's thinking. I mean... I'm not being funny. They'll all tell you in the Ask Do show that I do a rant every week because we do about cruelty to animals and all of this. And this seems to be just let go. Nobody's standing up for people are standing up for the animals, but it shouldn't be allowed to happen in the first place. But mm. then no government backing up. So what do you think of the government, the Illuminati, and, and all with that? Well, I mean, the first thing is controlling another human being in any way is a corrupt act. It's a violation of free will. So government necessarily is a violation of free will. But it does keep things organized. So really the question is, does our government match our current vibration as a humanity, our current state of mind as a civilization. And we might have grown out of some of the institutions we're waking up to the corruption of. Every government is in either a little bit or a lot corrupt. And really our judgment goes to uh, where are we coming from? As you come from a higher and higher place, uh, things look more and more corrupt in perspective, uh, in relationship to the truth that you're expressing 
So there might be a lot coming out right now. A lot of transparency and honesty work is being done right now, and we're revealing all of the corruption that's always been there, but we just weren't aware of it. Uh, now we have the opportunity to replace those corrupt institutions with institutions that have greater integrity, but we have to create them first. And there's no point fighting the corruption because it will just replace itself with more corruption. It's, uh, it's tilting at windmills. The better thing to do is to replace the corruption, come up with better systems that have more integrity, that do what we need them to do. And as we come up with those better systems and we come into agreement about, yes, this is a better system, and all it takes is that 10% of waste seers to come together and start doing that, everyone will see that the system is better and they will start adopting it just like they adopted Apple computers and iPhones. And next thing you know, that corrupt government, that corrupt system uh, that's been driving everyone crazy is no longer uh, receiving any power because people have adopted a new way of doing things. Yeah. I'll let Kathy have a little turn. Go on, Kathy. <laughs> yes, your comment you made a moment ago about um, the government and control, my first question that came to mind was, well, what kind of control? Control of the government or control of the people? And I'm a firm believer that we, the people, should not fear our government. Our government should no. fear the people. That's right. Mm. That's right. And if, if anyone who has a sense of where the power really lies, the only reason the government has any power is because the people are giving it power through their beliefs, through their honoring of the government's laws to their agreement with uh, the government's position. But at any moment, the population can say, nope, we want a different government, and instantly that can be the case. Instantly. If everybody in your territory agrees in, at, the ter at the drop of a hat that we are going to completely substantially change our government and we all agree on what that is, there is nothing to stop that population from doing that. Exactly. Do you know what? This is the thing on the ASU show. I've been ranting and raving for weeks, and I will send you links to my rants, okay, Gary? And you can listen to me. Mm -hmm. I have said this a thousand times to people. 5% is our government. 95% is the society. But the thing is, the blame lies with all of us, all 100% of us, in the sense of, 5% mm -hmm. the governments are doing what they feel is right and we're supposed to follow that. The 95% mm -hmm. is the same because we haven't stood up, opened our mouths, which are there to be used, and literally stood together and said, we've had enough. And right. until everybody just wakes up and smells the roses and says, actually, you've got a point there, Sue, why aren't we waking up and why aren't we joining the way seeing and why aren't we all joining forces as 95% of us, well, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many different things, Garrett, that are under this umbrella. And this is why we started Hey Mr. Government Globally on Facebook. And it was literally these people because we've got so many different things that we do with the ASU, like uh, going back to the animal cruelty and everything else. And and I keep saying to people, this is the same thing. We're, we're all mm -hmm. seeing these problems and we could all change it if we all stood together and said, <clears throat> we can actually make a change. We all stand together and tell the government, we don't like this. We want them to change the law to stop this from happening in the first place. It's never going to happen mm -hmm. if nobody stands together. Right. And we need to recognize that somewhere between uh, 80 and 90 percent of any given population is likely to be in the category of stabilizer. That means that although they can still recognize the truth and that they, are, they have good hearts and souls, it doesn't, they are going to reinforce the establishment. They are going to enforce the rules. That's their nature. That's how their brains work. And they feel very unsafe when rules are violated. It's very threatening to them because of the way that their uh, neurology works, or the way that their prefrontal cortex is programmed. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just something to understand. We have evolved as a human species for our populations to have between 80 and 90% of this stabilizer type 
Because if everybody was a wayseer, you'd have what could amount to massive amounts of chaos. Because what is required of wayseers to be constructive members of a community, to be real leaders, is for them to be tuned into something higher than themselves. So wayseers are a double-edged sword. Wayseers can be incredibly positive, but they can also be incredibly destructive. And the way to mitigate that destruct, destruction is for most of humanity to be uh, unsusceptible to that oscillation. Whereas the wayseers, some of them are going to be brilliant, positive uh, contributors to humanity because they are tuned into something higher than themselves. They're tuned into that divine inspiration. They're tuned into what you might call your spirituality. And because they're tuned into that higher good, they're receiving that, the inspiration of that higher good and they're bringing that into the world. But there are also many other way seers who are stuck on some form of addiction and compulsion and they're, they're rooted in a selfishness that is highly destructive. And those people actually do need to be contained until they grow up and turn on and tune in to something higher than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. What, now, I'm going to ask you a question, because um, obviously with everything that I've been doing, you will always get people that are not so behind you. What, what sort of an effect are you actually giving the people? You know, uh, have you had a lot of people question what you're about and everything and in a bad way, or has most of it been positive? I, I've had both. Uh, most of it, 98% of it's been positive. However, that 2% that is suspect of what I'm doing has been incredibly vocally negative at times and, uh, and very aggressive. Um, so what I've been accused of being uh, part of the CIA, I've been accused of, uh, you know, running some sort of, uh, um, you know, conspiracy thing driven by very rich, uh, you know, Illuminati or whatever. All these conspiracy theories have, like, cropped up around what am I trying to do with this manifesto. I've, I've been accused of encouraging psychopathy because I'm saying that the prefrontal – there's an agent within the prefrontal cortex that is a censoring agent that uh, the wayseer type has – overridden that censoring agent and therefore is free of uh, the constraints that that censoring agent generally places, places on one's mind. And so the argument is, well, that's what psychopaths are. And what I was just saying about wayseers behaving badly, those people who can be incredibly destructive, yes, they could be psychopaths. But I'm not encouraging people to be that way. I'm saying that there is a trait of openness that wayseers represent and we have a choice about whether we use that trait creatively and constructively to contribute to humanity or whether that trait can be the very thing that leads someone to be a sociopath or a psychopath or someone who is deeply afflicted with all sorts of destructive addictions or um, mood swings or whatnot. So people don't understand what I'm saying. And when they don't, some become very fearful and try to project all sorts of nonsense on either me or what my message is. Yeah, I, I can take all of that. We, we've sort of had that on the Ask Sue show, haven't we, Kathy, and various yeah. thoughts, because, and that's mainly because they don't understand. It's not, and I, I can't knock right. them, it's just that they obviously are not quite awake, and, you know, mm -hmm. I've sort of said to people, you know, I've had it chucked at me that, oh, we can't, um, we can't bring the world together. Do you know what I mean? We can't open people up to this. It's not going to open so quickly. We can't bring the world together. And I keep saying, oh, when Princess Diana died in the UK, the whole world mm -hmm. came together and mourned. Right. Yeah. So how did one person bring the whole world together that people keep telling me that we can't? Well, so there's a there's a funny thing about that. We can come together. We can drop all of the barriers and let go of all of the uh, suppression that society represents, and um, and walk away from uh, unjust laws and walk away from unjust governments. We can do all that. 
um, just like one can ride a bicycle with no support on it, like no training wheels. Uh, they just stay on those two wheels, and it's a graceful act. But if you're on a bicycle that's not moving, that's very hard to do. And so movement is like love. And when there is enough love in a population, something like that outpouring that you saw with Princess Diana can happen. But when there is not enough love in a population, it's like being on a bicycle that's not moving. And so if you try to take away the support structures, whether that's the kickstand or your legs on the ground or training wheels, that bicycle will fall over because it's so hard to balance on a bicycle that's not moving. It's so hard to balance a, a community of people that is working with a lack of love. Yeah. And so that's what we need to recognize is when there's not enough love in our communities, when there's not enough love in our populations, we can't get rid of these oppressive laws. We can't get rid of these oppressive governments because we will fall down. We will crumble as a civilization because people will behave wrongly. People will do the wrong things. People will exploit that, uh, that uh, reckless freedom. But when there is enough love in our populations, we can let go of those things. We don't need them. So there are times when we as a civilization or we as a society are like riding on those two wheels and we're moving forward and we have tons of love, but we've still got the training wheels on. And we sense that those training wheels are holding us back. But then there's other times when we've stopped, when there isn't enough love. And we can't be so arrogant and reckless as to say, well, no, let's get rid of the training wheels when we don't, aren't propelling ourselves with that love because we will crumble as a society without enough love in the system. Absolutely. I just want to read a couple of quotes that um, Gary Edwards, who's a very good friend of ours um, on the Ask Sue show, he's trying to stop <clears> the meat trade and is helping a lot of dogs literally to be saved from it. And he's put, we can choose to be affected by the world or we can choose to affect the world. And he also said, humanity regards itself as a superior species, but regarding animal welfare, there can only be one true name, the human disgrace. The human what? Disgrace. As the human disgrace. disgrace. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, my feeling is that life is the opposite of chaos. It is the antidote to the second law of thermodynamics, which says that everything is tilted towards chaos. And we're an expression of that life, but so is every living thing. And we need to have respect for that living essence that's in all of us. So for us to arrogantly think just because we have uh, greater cognitive abilities that somehow we're superior to other life forms um, can can be a huge arrogant mistake. Garrett, I have a question about your comment. Eighty to ninety percent of people are the stabilizers. What role mm -hmm. do you think plays? What what role do you think complacency plays in that large group of the population? I see that. Well, I wouldn't say. It's very uh, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, complacency or sort of, a, a, you know, you're seeing that, that lack of movement is, uh, is sort of, yeah, part of that, that nature. But it's, it's like when someone is part of that 80 to 90 percent, uh, they're not nearly as – they can't oscillate. They don't have swings nearly as wide as what wayseers have. So they will maybe swing between complacency and productivity, complacency and, uh, and, and just being a good member of society. Um, whereas wayseers have that greater swing of being incredibly beautiful contributors and leaders of society to, to being horribly disastrous um, criminals and derelicts. Um, and even, you know, tyrants. So uh, that complacency is just a reflection of lack of love, but then so is all the evil uh, that is done in the world is a reflection of that lack of love. The complacency is just a mitigated form of that, a repressed form of that lack of love. And uh, truthfully, I'd rather have, um, if there is a lack of love in a given 
group of people, I'd rather they be that 80 to 90% who are just complacently expressing their lack of love than uh, that 10 to 20% that could be violently expressing that lack of love because they have no repression. So I, I actually think the, the, that complacency on that end of the spectrum is it's nice to have that buffer where that's as bad as it gets. Definitely. That, okay, yes, that I can understand. Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> He's good, good. And what it all points... <laughs> What it all points to is that we are incredible. One of the great things about wayseers, if you look at the fMRI scans of wayseers, this uh, um, magnetic resonant um, scans of, of wayseers' brains, you'll see that they're actually very similar to those of every every all people when they are madly, uh, deeply in love. So when someone is madly, newly, deeply in love the way that their brains work is very similar to the way a wasier brain works all the time. The only difference is when you're madly, deeply in love, your your being is filled with love, and that love is what organizes your thoughts and your actions, just like life is what organizes chaos. You You have a chaotic system, and then you have life organize that chaotic system into a beautiful tree or a butterfly or an octopus or a giraffe like there's this organizing force that life represents well love is just the feeling of life that's love is what life feels like when you're really feeling it so when somebody is madly deeply in love they've got that that life force surging through them and that that life force that love is organizing their thoughts in such a way that they have this graceful ecstatic experience well wayseers have that same openness. The brain is wired just the same way, so they're completely open and ready for that ecstatic experience at all times. But if they're not in love, if they're not channeling that love, then it runs amok. Chaos takes over because there isn't that organizing force within their consciousness. So we have the opportunity to bring through ourselves as wayseers tremendous amounts of love or chaos, and that is both our gift and our curse. And so we as wasters have the responsibility to start tuning in to that love, to start filling ourselves with that love through some form of devotion or prayer or meditation each and every day so that we can bring forth through that day a, a gift of devotion to everyone we encounter, and that will fill the world with more love. It's just so inspiring to hear people talk like this, and there's just not enough of it around, is there, to be fair. But um, I just want to read, you must excuse me, the chat's just gone up the screen and now I can't see. All right, um, Katis has just said, it can be more painful for the sensitive person as opposed to the more Teflon-coated variety of person. I must say that being a, a sensitive person, a sponge, I'm hypersensitive to my surroundings and feeling of others. It can lead to great pain. <clears throat> Absolutely, and that's why for that person, tuning into that that transcendent love is so important, because then that love, that that experience of grace that comes through deep devotion to that higher love, that transcendent love, it is like a salve on all of the slights and injustices and things that uh, betray your sensitivity, all the things that uh, enrage your sensitivity all of that will be healed when you're m much more clearly f focused and aligned with with that that higher love and and that's what the great saints have managed to to be able to do and then your sensitivity is such a gift because you're you're turned on you're tuned in you've got something amazing working through you that protects your consciousness from the pain that your sensitivity could endure, and then your sensitivity becomes this amazing uh, antenna and, and tool for really tuning into what people need and what the world needs and, and being able to offer that. Exactly. Um, I'm just seeing if I could actually get Max in on this guy. Now, I don't know how good this clip is, but well, I've got to give it a go because I know Max is um, an absolute 
think the world of everything that you're all about. And even if he just has a little speech and then um, calls mm -hmm. later, that, um, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? We'll, but we'll give it a go, okay? Sure. I, I know. All right, let's go for it. <laughs> I hope this works now. Let me just see. Hold a minute. Oh, it doesn't want to work yet. Hold a minute. Let's have a look. Right, hopefully. Kathy, have you got another question while we just get Max in? I was just about to ask if I had time. Um, yeah, Garrett, Garrett. I'm one of these people. Now, Garrett, I'm in my mid-50s. I'm, I'm a child mm -hmm. of the 70s. And, you know, when I was in school, we never heard of ADHD, ADD, nothing like that. Um, I was mm -hmm. always a leader, always a leader in my school uh, from the first grade. On uh, fundraisers, I always raised the most money. Uh, I was always popular. I made good grades. Um, and even now today, I'm 56, and I find that I am like a magnet for people who are lost, younger people especially. They come to me for advice. They come to me for love. They come to me, and I have reached several times the point where I had to step back because I, mm -hmm. I, I can feel myself absorbing their their pain. Yep. But I never let yep. it control me, and and I mm -hmm. have to immediately deflect it and deflect it with love. And mm -hmm. I've had so many people that, honestly, I've seen with my own eyes how I've turned their life around. And mm -hmm. I've always wondered what it was about my spirit or about my soul or my mere presence that people felt, they. I mean, they can talk to me like, I mean, a perfect stranger talk to me like they've known me forever tell me their mm -hmm. deepest, darkest secrets. And I'm a good yeah. confidant. I'm a loyal friend. Mm -hmm. And I don't go and laugh 